Okay. Welcome everyone. Thanks for joining me for today's webinar on Spotlight on Construction. My name is Trisha Grace and I'm the Alumni Employer Engagement Coordinator with the alumni team. I'm delighted to introduce our panelists today who will share insights on how healthy the construction industry is coming out of COVID-19, the future direction of the industry and career opportunities. I'll start by introducing Lori Skelos, who is a graduate of our Honours Bachelor of Technology program. Maybe you could wave. I don't know if they, they know where who's who. Um, before coming to GBC, Lori had a successful career in the areas of operations and finance across a wide variety of industries. She successfully pivoted into the construction industry and is currently working as an estimator for Ellis Dawn. Welcome, Lori. Thank you. Camille Bonner spent the first half of her career in the non-for-profit sector, then made her way to the for-profit world to work in HR and has been happily working in the construction industry for the past 13 years. She's currently working as a talent acquisition manager at Maple Rangers Group, where she manages a team of recruiters who find top talent across Ontario. I think it's only Ontario, but across Ontario. Welcome, Camille. Robert Bonotto is a construction engineering management graduate. He has had 24 years in the construction and development industry in Ontario, successfully constructing condos, stack house, sorry, stack townhouses, movie theaters, and luxury custom homes. He now runs his own successful custom home building company. Welcome, Rob. And lastly, I'd like to introduce Maple Cousin, who is a graduate from two programs at George Brown College. The first was special event planning, and the second was construction engineering technologies. She has stuck with the construction industry and is currently working as an assistant site superintendent for Tridel. Welcome, Mabel. So thanks everyone for joining us today. There's a bit of housekeeping uh, before we get going. So for the participants, um, if you're experiencing any connection issues or you have a question you'd like to pose to the panelists, please click on the chat on the lower right-hand side and enter your question there or your concern there. Um, there. That's also where you're going to find the link for captioning. So if you need captioning, if you click on chat, you'll find the link there and you just click on that and the captioning should begin for you. Uh, the question, so the, the talk will actually go till about uh, 12, 11, or sorry, 1240. And then we have about 10 minutes for questions. So put your questions in the chat. I will get them uh, towards the end of the discussion and I'll present them to the, the panelists. And that is about it, I think. Oh, the other thing is uh, to see the panelists, if you go up to the layout at the top of your screen, you can go into layout and change the, the pattern of the grid and, and how you see the panelists. So you feel free to do that. Okay, I think we're ready to go. Exciting. I'm really excited about this. I, you know, this is wonderful to learn about the different industries that are doing so well, even during this, this crazy time we're experiencing. And uh, as far as I know, the construction industry is, is a fairly healthy one, but I think our panelists are going to be able to share with us their experience and give some insight around that. So I'm gonna begin. My first question is for Camille. So Camille, as a recruiter, what sort of impact has been felt during the past year and a half as the industry has had to weather the blows of COVID-19 pandemic? So uh, just a bit of a correction. I actually, my team and I uh, support the entire company. So we, we recruit across Canada. Um, and so with regards to the pandemic and how that has impacted recruitment, we have unfortunately, as a lot of construction companies have experienced, um, some projects that have been canceled um, and some projects that have been delayed. So that obviously impacts recruitment and the amount of staff we need and the type of staff that we need. Um, a lot of companies obviously wanted to, you know, wait it out to see how this uh, pandemic um, impacted them economically and how the, the economy was impacted. Um, so we obviously, you know, there were some positions initially that we had to put on hold and it was very drastic. It was, you know, we went from, you know, having to recruit, you know, and fill 30 positions. So at one point we were down to maybe 10 um, and that lasted for a couple of months and slowly 
organizations felt more comfortable with, you know, either continuing um, with some of the construction that we had. Um, we've also seen an, an increase in the amount of health and safety um, positions that we've had to fill. A lot of our clients are looking for, um, you know, as to obviously increase the amount of health and safety that we have on site with the, with the pandemic. And so we've, um, you know, we've had an increase in, in our health and safety team. Um, we now have seen that things are starting to return to normal in terms of the construction industry. So the roles have started to pick right back up, but I would say that Definitely the pandemic had uh, a great impact in the amount of roles that we um, filled initially um, and the type of roles that we were filling initially. So we, we saw a decrease in some of the site positions only because some of the site projects were put on hold, um, but things are right back to, to normal in terms of the recruitment. I think you're on mute. Sorry. Um, it's interesting to see that, you know, whenever you have uh, things that impact an industry, you're going to have growth in one area and maybe a diminishment of certain roles in others. So it's interesting to, to see that health and safety has really picked up as far as uh, those sort of roles that have opened up. Absolutely. Great. Thank you. Um, Robert, you've been in the construction industry for almost 25 years since your graduation in 1997. That is amazing. Um, you've seen a lot, I would think. What are the new and emerging technologies in the construction industry and how will that impact the demand for new employees? Well, uh, Trisha, thanks for the question. Um, 25 years uh, is actually, a, a, I, I look back and I look at the 25 years and I tell you the truth, it seems like it's gone by in two. Um, I'll focus on a couple things. Over the last 25 years, I would say the most significant changes that I have seen more focused on the site and on the construction, actual physical construction of it. In the last 25 years, uh, there's been a great big increase on the size of equipment, the speed of the large equipment. I'm talking about the large excavating equipment, the cranes. Um, the, in the 25 years, we are at the point from when I had first set foot on um, a site is an example <clears throat> uh, bulk excavation is a big part of the high-rise world, and um, as quickly as you can bulk excavate out a site, um, the better the project will start off. When I first started in the field, for an example, with the size of machinery that uh, was being used, we were loading trucks, um, triaxle trucks, and it would take approximately a minute 20 to a minute 40 seconds to load that truck. The new equipment and some of the larger equipment that the excavating and bulk excavators have now are loading trucks in two shovels. So they are actually cut the truck loading down to 40 seconds. Okay. Where that becomes a great uh, large difference is down in the core. Okay. The core of Toronto is obviously tight. Um, there's not a lot of room. Um, time and in construction development, time is everything. Okay. Time is money. Um, so the one large difference I've seen was the equipment size and the speed of the equipment. Going into, I would say, the last decade, okay, the last decade, I've seen a lot of changes in building envelope and um, finishing materials. I've seen a large, a large transition of uh, building materials go from a natural um, a building material to actually a man-made vinyl rubber plastic material that has mm -hmm. the capabilities, the prints, the colors and textures of a natural product, right? Um, as a builder developer, that has become important to us because again, it comes down to cost. It comes down to passing on value to the homeowners. And on the builder side, we always, we really watch regarding warranties. Tarion is a big part of the residential world and the construction industry. And it is important for us as developers and builders to make sure that not only when you're doing the construction after the construction, but the homeowners and purchasers of your projects are happy. And that a lot of it has come down to the change of the building materials from natural to man-made that gives everyone a natural look at a cheaper cost and helps out the builder later on with warranty and aftercare. Okay, interesting. 
and also I was I was also curious about the the digital technology that's coming on as well around um, you know what are some of the, the 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 new knowledge that you need to have when you enter the field around in a digital aspect. Well, the I guess from 25 years ago when I started at George Brown College, we were we were into the early stages of what I would say to the like back. 25 years ago was the very first times that we would start seeing laptops, computers into the job site, right? Mm -hmm, uh, mm -hmm. When I first sat, when I first sat, uh, when I first was on my first site, it was still fax machines. Okay. It wasn't mm -hmm. until probably my third year that we started getting into printers, computers, uh, laptops, um, where it has transferred to now is actually probably almost out of where I can almost say I've dated myself. Now it's almost out of <laughs> realm of where the technology is now, especially with carry on reports, audits, mm -hmm. deficiency list reports. I think, I think Tridel probably leads the way in um, uh, computer based uh, programs and technology that has propelled the industry into that. Now we are now looking me being a little bit older school. When I go into the hiring um, process, I'm actually. Um, looking more forward or more looking more for a student or a future employee that obviously has that technical basic background, mm -hmm. right? Um, some of the developers in the last little while have actually had to hire um, um, an IT or someone to help out some of the staff that I would say is over the 25 year experience mark into the transition of the new technologies of computers and into the new programs, especially for scheduling and, uh, and um, safety policies and safety um, um, coordinations and stuff that happen on the site every day, all day, six days a week. Mm -hmm. And therefore, Camille, you might be feeling the same thing when you go to recruit that the, the new skill set has probably shifted a little bit. Um, Lori, I have a question for you. So you started your career in a very different direction, different field. How did you get drawn to the construction industry and how hard was it to pivot into the industry? It's very interesting to speak after Rob because Rob and I are kind of different ends of the spectrum there in terms of he's been doing it for so long, has that experience, whereas I came to it late, but also have, again, went through school in the last four years where all of the technology he was just speaking to, for me, is just the way I've learned. So there's no unlearning, there's no relearning. Um, for me, it was a case of where I'd probably say about five years ago, what Rob was speaking about in a lot of respects, I would have had no idea what he was talking about. Um, I, I did not have, did not even think about construction as a potential industry for me to move into, just given my background. Um, did not like what I was doing, couldn't see myself doing it for the next however many years we have these days until retirement. And so I just started looking at different positions and I happened to come across the construction coordinator position and looked through it out of, I, I don't, still can't tell you what made me look at it to this day, but looked through it and I was like, I can, I can do this job. I don't know much about construction, but I can learn construction. Everyone at some point has learned what they do, but the basic skills, what they know that they're looking for, I'm like, I have these skills through different industries. My background in finances, operations, it really did, it, it, it seems so clear that it would have been not an easy pivot, but a very reasonable, sensible pivot. Like it was, it was when you looked at it sort of note by note, you're like, yeah, no, I can definitely do this. And so I started to investigate it. Um, I came across the Georgia Brown program, which I was lucky to know someone who happened to be in at that point. And it, again, just going through it, it really sort of clicked. And I say to this day, I should have been in construction from the minute I left high school, but because I'm unfortunately just, I'm going to say bad marketing by the construction industry for the last blah, 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 years, um, it wasn't seen as an opportunity for someone like myself. But uh, yeah, it was actually, again, and going into school and now in the industry, I am using those skills that I had learned in my previous jobs all the time. And I'm adding on to them all of that construction knowledge and just building up this new industry expertise which at some point I hope to be where Rob is at. So yeah, no, it, was, it wasn't, what the skills that you have, I think any job that you have, there's always a transferable skill. It's just learning the specifics of it. Well, that's a really good point around transferable skills and to take a look at what you have and where you can use those skills. And that's the whole reason I'm focusing on industry is I think you're right, Lori, people tend to think construction, they think hard hat and they don't realize all the other skills that are involved, all the capacity that people can bring into roles and that the industry hires for all kinds of positions, uh, marketing, business, project management, HR. And so to just 
widen that that scope, which is great. Um, okay, well, I, Maple, I wanted to ask you a question because you're kind of in the same circumstance. My Leo went kind of funny one sec. Uh, <laughs> yeah, there we go. Uh, Maple, you had the same circumstance. You started at George, you graduated from George Brown College in event planning, and then you shifted over to construction. And tell us a little bit about how that shift happened for you. So funny enough, um, it was at an event. I was working at a real estate investment conference and you realize how much opportunity is actually in construction and real estate um, and those types of fields. So speaking to what Lori said, like the marketing is not great, but when you're in it and you see what kind of opportunities and what kind of, I like said like the different fields, the marketing, the HR, like I initially, when I went to that event and I started looking into it, I really wanted to get into design. But after my first year, I was like, this is not really for me. I can't see myself, you know, sitting at a computer all day, um, you know, doing CAD or doing anything like that. So I shifted again to construct to the construction side, uh, the construction program. And that was actually a much better fit, especially with my skills from event planning. Mm -hmm. Very interesting. Oh, OK. I, I, yeah, it's, it's what sort of skills did you feel that you were you were pulling from into the, the new industry? So I think. The big thing, um, well, like when I was in school that I realized it's a lot of uh, scheduling, budgeting, or skills, like a lot of this, uh, like the soft skill of problem solving and working with people, mm -hmm. uh, really, really key um, to succeeding in the, in, the, uh, in the industry. But you learn that pretty quick. And then like, yeah, just being able, like a go-getter and, uh, you know, the, the problem solving, I think is a big thing and managing. I really enjoy that aspect of event planning and I enjoy that aspect of construction as well. Fantastic, that's great. And so Camille, where is the growth strongest in the construction industry that you're, you're seeing right now? As we move out of this year into a new year, 2022, um, where will the greatest employment demand be? So I can speak uh, for, for Maple Rinders. <laughs> it's hard to speak for other organizations, but mm -hmm. we have seen growth um, in two, on two ends. So in the skilled trades, we have, there's a lot of organizations that are trying to um, manage the risk that is associated with, uh, with construction. And quite often the risk lies in when you're relying on someone else, like a skilled, uh, like a sub trade to do the work for you. So we have actually launched our own um, concrete and electrical division. So we now have a high demand for a lot of, uh, you know, electricians, uh, electrical apprentices, um, concrete foreman, concrete laborers. So we're seeing a huge demand for the skilled trades. Um, and I think uh, some organizations are also kind of not even following suit, but they've either already done, uh, made that transition or they are starting to. Um, but we've also seen a shift in um, the need for a lot of um, people who are strong with technical uh, applications. So I think Rob had mentioned it and uh, Lori also kind of alluded to, um, you know, a lot of technology being implemented into construction. Um, it just it, it makes things um, more efficient. Um, you know, it, it takes a lot of the guessing game out of things when there's technology that you can rely on. So, you know, we've, we've seen an increase in the amount of projects that we use that use BIM and the BIM technology. Um, we've also, you know, seen uh, an increase in the amount of technology that's used for scheduling and for estimating for project management. Um, so being able to kind of navigate those applications is going to be very important. So um, just being kind of in tune with technology and, and being able and being comfortable using it is going to be very important for those who are working more so on the, um, what we call them more of kind of project management office-based positions mm -hmm. versus the site positions. Even on site, we're, we're seeing an increase in technology. You know, a lot of our, our sites are using iPads to, to do deficiencies and, and reviewing drawings using iPads. So um, there's definitely a, a shift in that. I think that's been coming for a while, um, but with COVID, I think that's actually propelled that shift to happen even faster. Um, so that's going to be something that those who are, are looking to get into the industry um, should kind of be aware of. And, uh, you know, I think a lot of the schools are obviously adapting a lot of the technology, but for those who maybe this is a second career for them, um, that'll be something that they'll have to, you know, pick up really quickly and, and stay on top of. 
Okay. All right. Great. And and do you do you do you find that too, Robert? You've been you're a hiring manager. You've probably done tons of hiring. Um, do you find that too when you're looking at hiring new grads? What's your advice to them around you know skilling up um, to really present themselves in a competitive way? Well, Tricia, um, I'll go. Uh, I want to relate back to a little bit of my history. Um, my family's background was in construction, um, so it was very um, natural for me to lend myself into this, um, to educate myself into this. Um, something I can say that uh, to looking forward to get into the industry, something that I think is very important to young grads, and this comes from my past experience. Um, when I entered into the workforce after graduation, um, I was very comfortable uh, in the field and in large projects, right? That comes back from my history and past of previous years being on large high rise sites with the family business and then me deciding to um, uh, spin off and go um, and actually work separately with the developer. It became very comfortable for me to work on large sites early because of my past experience of working with my family. Going forward, one thing I always say um, to students is I feel and this is me, but I feel that it is important in this industry to try and start in the field, on the field, in sight, not straight into the office. Um, uh, when we graduated um, back in the day, there were certain students that went straight into a assistant project management position or straight into an office position. And there were other students that decided to go more into the physical industry part of it, more to the on-site learning. Um, the immense amount of things that you learn on site, including the personalities, including the early mornings, including the weather, the climate, it makes you a better rounded construction industry person, right? So I will always lend to the fact that I would ask all people that work for me is to start on site, right? Get your boots wet, get them dirty, right? Learn the ins and outs, and uh, and I just feel like that was the the way that fast tracked me to where I am and to what I'm uh, what we're doing now, and just made it very comfortable for me in transition, right? A lot of students when they graduated they had difficulty um, starting off on large sites, started off on small sites. That's fine too, but I do believe it has to start on the site, right? Boots on, hard on. Work with the people that do it day in and day out. You'll learn a lot more. Well, I think that's interesting because it ties back to, you know, it, it it's learning a culture. Every industry has a kind of culture, I think. And it's a little bit what Maple's saying, you know, you take your skills and you apply them in different ways. But when you understand the culture, maybe being on the ground, seeing what's actually happening helps you to develop a greater insight into that culture so you can do far better in the office or in any position you take. Yeah, later on when you're in the office, um, uh, when the communication discussions happen to you from the site, you understand their problems, right? You understand that that one hour drive became three hours that morning. It wasn't supposed to rain. It did rain. The personalities, the personalities and the changes that happened from a Monday morning to a Friday afternoon. Right? Mm -hmm. There's, I always say that, that not only is uh, construction site staff on site to watch the industry and do, and do their job, they're also there actually as motivators, right? One thing I've always said, I think I've been really good at is I've always motivated the site, right? When I was on site, I motivated the sites. Everyone has to pull the rope the same way. If anyone's pulling the rope the opposite way, it's not good for the industry, not good for the site, not good for morale, not good for anything, right? So those are the, the people skills, the soft skills oh. are so important. Oh, yeah. Um, Lori, I have a question for you. Um, and it, it's going back to that that culture that we talk about in construction. And you're a member of the Canadian Association of Women in Construction. Um, why did you choose to join? And what's your impression of the working environment for women in the construction field? Is it a welcoming one? What would you like to see change? Um, it's interesting. I often think that I am glad I'm joining industry right now in this specific time, because we are at a point where as an industry, the need for folks across the board is so great that 
as an industry, it's had to force itself to update who it looks at. Sort of back to your original point about when we're sort of taught about construction or we think about construction at a certain point, we see folks in hard hats on the site. But when we think about the faces under those hard hats, we think of a very specific kind of face. That is both gender wise, that is culturally like you just you see that and you don't think of you. You look at how small of a person you would be within that world that is represented by a majority. So something like Haywick and there are a multitude of organizations that help with is just great as a it, it's an organization that helps you to speak to other women who have been through it. Other women who are not just been through it are still working through it. People who are at your situation starting out, people who have been in it for a long time a certain mentorship sort of notion where they can tell you what they've gone through. There's the shared experience of being part of a minority of this very, very large industry. And it's interesting, as Rob was speaking, this is something where I, so I've gone right to the office and I, as the, the scenario has been very, very welcoming at the office, but I know as, as, as a woman, I know on site, I've heard that is not the same because there is a different, again, it is a different culture, much to Rob's point. There is a different culture when you're on site, when you're in the office. Again, I'm in an estimating, so it's a very different sort of part of the process. Mm -hmm. And I have had, I, I'm in a department which has a large number of women. And again, just welcoming across the board. But like I said, from some of my peers who have gone right to site, you sometimes fall into, depending upon who you're working with, and again, the culture of the, of the company specifically that you're at, you may end up doing, you know, traffic watches when you want to get down in there and do a little bit more. So it really, it, it's so dependent. But generally speaking, for myself and from those who I've spoken to, it's getting better. It's moving in the right direction, which is, you know, mm -hmm. kind of all you mm -hmm. can ask for. And again, I think with the demand for so many more folks, um, you have to, we've opened our mind to terms of who can do what and realize, oh, yeah, no, we can all do pretty much everything. Yeah. Okay. Those are really good points around, you know, it's just, I think it is a, it's, it's a bit of a seismic shift, but the shift has started and that's a good thing. And I, I, you know, we know at the college, a lot more women are entering the programs that we offer. So there's a huge interest in joining the construction industry, but it has, you know, it has, there are some things that are fundamentally need to change. Um, but the great thing is that it's on track for that. And I think this, one of the things is, is speaking to younger people is really getting to them when they are, not just when they're applying for college, but really when they're younger and letting, again, people who would traditionally not think of themselves as part of the industry, as letting them know, you can be part of this industry, you have a lot to bring. This is not the job for someone who, again, there's always aspirations from families and things like that. This is a great mm -hmm. industry to be in and the possibilities and potential for you to do so many things is there. And really starting to have people understand that construction is not what you think it is. It's so much more than that. Fantastic. Now, Maple, you're on the ground, so to speak. You are an assistant site supervisor, so you have your own experiences. Uh, again, tell me about um, or us about the, the the skills that you find you rely on to succeed as a site superintendent, site supervisor. So yeah, so I am on the ground. Um, I think so. Some of the transferable stuff that I found from event planning um, was being adaptable was one of the first ones, being able to think on your feet, be adaptable, and then the ability to kind of like triage and prioritize issues. Um, I specialize in quality control, so knowing things that need to be fixed right away or things that can be left to a later date, um, things that we should be looking at in advance in terms of the quality assurance aspect. Um, and making sure we do it the right way. So making sure I'm working with the supers, scheduling, and making sure I'm not holding anyone back. So that's all uh, really, really important. And then um, again, I think I've touched on this before, but your ability to work with people, and as Rob talked about, the personalities, um, you get all sorts on site, and I'm sure you can attest to that. So it's, it's being able to work with them, and uh, also it's the attitude your attitude that you bring. So Lori, you asked Lori about women in construction. Um, I found everyone to be very respectful of who I am, listen to what I say. Um, I don't know if it's just because of position, but I also think it's the attitude. I don't tend to impose my will on the trades because they should be the specialists, but I am there to listen. I am there to work with them and they understand that. And I think that's something they, they respect. So I think that's an important skill is 
how to work with people. And I don't think it, it really matters if you're a woman or a man in that, in respect, in that respect. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, well said, Mabel. Uh, Camille, I have a question for you as someone frontline recruiting. Um, when you are recruiting for particular roles, first of all, you mentioned it's a lot of the skilled trades. Um, what are some of those um, skills that you require when you're looking at a, a ton of resumes? Are you, you know, as far as administrative skills and those hard skills, um, also, what are you looking for when you interview people around the soft skills? Can you share? I know the grads are always really interested in, you know, how do they succeed? What do they need to demonstrate on a resume as far as skills? And then what do they need to talk about in an interview and demonstrate as far as, you know, experience, soft skills, that kind of thing? Mm -hmm. So we actually um, recruit for everything from co-op positions to senior level executive positions, superintendents, project managers, you name it. Um, and then the skilled trades. So in terms of like technical skills, um, when you're hiring for the skilled trades, obviously it's a little bit more technical because they're quite hands on, but we do have an apprenticeship program. So there are for those who are, are looking to get into the field, as long as, you know, they've kind of started the process, we'll help them get through that process. Now for the other roles, uh, IT, safety, HR, um, even, you know, project coordinator, um, having the base knowledge is always helpful. I mean, it's it's really, uh, you know, it's hard for me to say, yeah, we'll hire just anyone. We'll hire a photographer for our project coordinator role. I don't think that's realistic, but um, having the base knowledge is important. But there are so many people that have that base knowledge. And so what sets individuals apart, me personally, um, the soft skills are usually a harder skill to develop or to, uh, I mean, it can't be taught, but to to develop. So I really look for the soft skills. So, um, you know, a, a lot of individuals, even co-op students will leave off, you know, the, the high school position that they had or the part-time position that they had at a fast food chain restaurant or at a, um, at a retail store. Um, and I think those are some of the most important uh, things to keep on your resume because you, you develop skills. Um, you know, Mabel talked about problem solving skills um, the skill to collaborate, um, to be to able to to be able to adapt to a changing environment. Those are all skills that will make you very successful in a role in within our organization. And those are our skills that you'll learn and develop working in in those type of environments. So I think it's important for individuals to highlight those and not hide them. Um, also, um, I know a lot of students who have started their own little side summer business. Maybe it was you know. Um, doing lawn care or landscaping. And so oftentimes they think that's because it's not necessarily related to construction, they leave it off or they don't highlight it in their interviews. And I think, you know, the the ability to to start something and see it through is a, is a good skill to have. And also just having that entrepreneurial spirit is important. We run a business, we, our, our clients and our, our importance. So relationship building is important. And um, it's a skill that not everybody has, but if you've started your own business and has had to build that relationship, those relationships to, to build that clientele, that's going to be something that's very important to, to note and to mention. Um, so those are all soft skills that I look for. It's a little trade secret of mine. Um, but yeah, I, I always tell individuals, you know, who maybe didn't make the cut, you know, well, what, what did you not leave on your, what did you not put on your resume um, that, you know, that you could have put on or you could have left on there. And oftentimes they'll say, yeah, I worked at, you know, fast food chain restaurant for a couple of years. And I'm like, why didn't you put it on there? And, um, or why didn't you highlight it when you were in the middle of the interview? Um, so I think those are important, especially for those coming out of a co-op um, or coming out of, of college or university who may not have um, years of experience under their belt, um, but, you know, might have those soft skills that will set them apart from, from ind other individuals. Okay, and Robert, I know you also are involved in hiring, Rob. Um, do you agree with, with Camille? Are those the sort of things that you look for or what's your make it or break it sort of thing that when, when you're looking at resumes or interviewing someone, what really are you looking for that's gonna make the difference? Well, again, going back the way that I uh, climbed the ladder, I always look back for past uh, experiences which Camille mentioned, even something as small as she said, the landscaping or trim carpentry or worked for something in the summer, the smallest things are important. I look at it as, 
I look at it as that's that's you're showing passion. And I think in this industry, passion is very important. When someone stands in front of me and they've done two or three years of schooling and um, and they're ready to enter in the field, one thing I ask and I look in look into those people is their passion of why they're in this industry. Okay. I got in this industry because I enjoyed the fascination of being able to start with a blank piece of land and actually build someone's home, right? Or someone's condo or someone's office space, something that is probably the most important thing in their life besides maybe family and love. Their home is mostly, is always going to be their, their number one asset. And um, my passion has come from, um, from being able to do that for people, right? Mm -hmm. And uh, so when someone is sitting in front of me, I look at, um, I look at uh, why did they get into the industry? What are they looking for in the future? And where do they get their excitement from, right? My excitement mm -hmm. is from having those structures in the air. And, you know, literally like we see, and the kids probably, or the uh, students probably see the memes. It's like, you know, I built that. I was part of that. I was in a team that did that, right? That's the type of thing that uh, uh, has kept me going, has kept me excited in this industry. And um, I look for future employees to have that same sort of uh, uh, understanding of why they want to be in this industry. That's what I look for. So a kind of enthusiasm and, and, and pride in the work that they're going to present. So that, yeah. you're right. Those are, are two very important. I, I feel that that's the, the base point that makes everything else easier. Okay. At that point, mm -hmm. you have that. Um, if you have a good supervisor, you have a good boss, they can teach you things, right? The mm -hmm. passion has to be there though. Right. If the passion is not going to be there to be there at six o'clock in the morning or six thirty in the morning, and sometimes put in those early, uh, those early years to put in those times till eight nine o'clock at night as concrete's pouring, um, crane breakdowns. That you, you have to have that passion. If you don't have that passion, it's it's very difficult to work through the rest of the problems or the or or the uh, circumstances or anything that else that comes around yeah. site, right i think i think having passion allows you to ride through those really tough times that are inevitable in any job right where you feel a little bogged down but if you really are excited about the work you do and passionate it'll get you through those tougher times yep uh, um i have a question for Lori, and i wanted to know because you are fair you're one of the newer grads out there and i wanted to know because i know i know grads listening in are always wondering about networking networking so did you use networking to make contacts within the industry before you graduated? Um, yeah, and I'll be honest, coming into it, I, I, the word networking brings like a chill to my heart because it just sounds so, I don't know, there's something about it that sounds just a little bit sort of backhanded. But what I realized is that networking is just another word for relationship building. And to Camille's point, this business, I think it doesn't matter what area you're in, it is all about relationships, which I think can be said of many businesses, but really the relationships you build in the short time I've been in it, the relationships I've built within my department, within my company, with the trades that I deal with, with other companies sort of, you know, and that extends to outside of, again, in a more social networking sort of component. And, and sort of to Rob's point, one of the things that it really raised as well was one of the going to these events that again and there are so many out there as an industry the passion that rob talks about i got bowled over at first to see just how as an industry everyone loves to do their job everyone loves it and if you are the person who's not passionate you definitely stand out a little bit within your sort of circles there i was yeah. and it was great to see because i had that passion as well and to surround yourself with like-minded people who can again someone who's starting out help you in directions um, and and sort of to the original point about with COVID, when things have to pivot, when we change how we deal with each other, when we're not being able to do meetings in person, having those relationships, being able to call someone up, asking them, hey, what's it looking like in the industry? What's like, what do you see from your vantage point? Mm -hmm. Those are super, super helpful when you're getting started out and significantly continued on again, because we're all, we may work for different companies, we may work in different departments, but we're all in it to do the same thing. It's a massive industry. We're all trying to promote it. We're all trying to build the best buildings that are out there, just do the best for our clients. So that relationship building, again, I prefer to call it relationship building than networking because networking just, I feel, has like a bad sort of uh, patina about it from the past. Um, but yeah, it's, it's, it's super important. 
it's these people you're going to, some of them you're going to work with. I have crossed paths with folks that I didn't go to school with, haven't worked with, but have met them at various events and it's come up again and again. And you start to, you know, you just start to build that network of folks in and around you. And again, especially as a new person, it's just the learnings you can gather from those who have the experience within the industry and specifics of it is just bar none. So I, yeah, I, any, and there's so many opportunities out there to, to network. Even now when we're not doing things in person, I think every group is trying to do things online, trying to maintain that. So it's, mm -hmm. it's out there. You have to look for it, but they're just great opportunities. Good point about, you know, networking. It sounds like it's a job. It's, a, it's this duty you have. And then, you know, it's such an organic thing to meet people and be interested in who they are and what they're doing and, and building that relationship. So it's an excellent point. How about you, Maple? Were you, I know you, you know, again, you're a relatively new grad. Um, how did you get your first position? Yeah, so Trisha, I've been in the industry uh, just over four years now, so relatively new. Um, actually, through my network, <laughs> I uh, I met a, a couple people, I met recruiters, um, so it was actually a recruiter that helped me get my first job in the industry. And then the second job I had was through a friend, and then the third job was, you know, the same manager i had at my first job really needed somebody called me because she want, wanted to work to get uh, work together again so you can't discount how much your network and the people that you meet uh in this industry are going to help you even like in my position um you, you know sometimes you got to fill in a blank sometimes you have an issue something maybe extremely technical too and mm -hmm. i have reached deep down in my networks and said hey do you know anyone that can do this this or this because I am really stuck. And it's, you know, having people there that you can ask is a really big help and, you know, helps solidify your place, I think, a little bit in the industry because it shows that passion um, and you get things done because construction is all about getting things done, I think, uh, or else you wouldn't have buildings. So. <laughs> so it's a good point about, you know, you build a reputation and then you can, then when people understand who you are and the skills you bring and the attitude you bring, um, they're going to refer you for other jobs. So it starts to happen where you, you don't even have to apply for work. I would imagine after a while, people just get to know you. Um, you're referred. Your your reputation kind of precedes you into your job. So that, that's very cool. Um, okay. So now, Camille, you're someone. So this is networking, which is really important. And volunteering is a huge part of networking. And one thing, Camille, that I found very interesting as I learned about you is how much you volunteer. And I wanted to to get your take on is that is that something that you would suggest grads think about doing as they build out their career? Absolutely. So uh, volunteering does a couple of things. Um, a, it, it's just uh, great to do, <laughs> even if you're not gaining anything of it uh, out of it per se. But um, a couple of things that volunteering has done for me is to help for those who are not comfortable necessarily going to events networking events volunteering is a great way to build your network um you know and it's it's pandemic proof because <laughs> networking events have have you know dwindled off obviously and who knows when we're going to get back to more of those networking events but if you're if you're volunteering somewhere you're bound to build relationships with individuals um it'll help with uh you know coming out of your shell if you if you are more of an introvert um, it'll help with just gaining contacts. Sometimes you're able to, um, you know, find employment through some people that you you volunteer with, or they're able to refer you to others within, um, you know, within the industry you're looking to get into. Um, and also just thinking about those who don't have the opportunity to, uh, you know, have a co-op placement. Not every program has it. Not everyone's able to secure one. So volunteering mm -hmm. is great um, to to gain those skills because. Coming out of school sometimes can be tough when you don't have any experience. So you're like, where do you start, right? A lot of positions are looking for like a year of experience, even for the entry level roles. Well, where do you get that year of experience if you didn't have a co-op placement or if you weren't able to source and find your own summer job? Um, and mm -hmm. volunteering can definitely help you with that. And sometimes you'll find, you know, some organizations that are or companies that are starting up that maybe can't afford a co-op student or haven't even thought about the co-op placement and and quite often they'll they'll take on you know students you know even if it's a day or two a week um to just gain that experience um and to mm -hmm. to understand what it's like to work in whatever environment that you're looking to work in so if it's a fee if it's a field position or an office position 
Um, another bonus, I think, um, to to working in um, that position, in the co-op or sorry, uh, a volunteer position is to develop those soft skills that I talk about. So, you know, the technical skills is one thing, but the soft skills is so important. And I think we've all kind of talked about, you know, the soft skills and, you know, and how important it is. Um, but developing those is going to be important. Um, and it's going to set you apart from, you know, your peers and those that you're competing for roles um, against. Um, so volunteering, and, and I, I think it'd be great to, if you could volunteer in the field that you're interested in, but even if you're not, I think soft skills are developed, uh, you know, in most positions that you volunteer in. So mm -hmm. I, I think it's helped me even after being in the, you know, in a recruitment or HR role for 10 plus years, I still volunteer um, and it's still helping me in terms of my career. And, you know, it helps me to to be a better presenter. It helps me to, to you know, be less um, uh, shy when I, I'm not really a shy person, but it still helps me to kind of, you know, help with public speaking. It helps. There's so many different soft skills that I continue to develop when I volunteer mm -hmm. um, and it just feels good. And it's also something great to put on your resume. And I, I look for it. I, I, you know, when people volunteer, I look for something like that. It's, it's a great conversation starter. So usually if I'm interviewing, I'll say, hey, I see that you volunteer at this organization. Tell me a little bit about that. And, um, you know, typically it, it kind of is a, a good icebreaker for the candidate because they're usually a little nervous. So but they're usually mm -hmm. passionate about what they're volunteering about. So it's a great icebreaker. So I always say volunteering, you can't go wrong with it. It'll, it'll definitely help in some way, shape or form. Absolutely. All right. Thank you, Camille. I'm looking at our time. And so what I'm going to suggest is we have a wrap up comment. Um, one last bit of advice for graduates. Uh, and I'm going to start with Rob. Last word of advice for graduates. Smile on your face. <laughs> Early mornings. Work hard. There's going to be difficult days, but the fruitful days will uh, will surpass the difficult days. That's my lasting comment. Perfect. <laughs> Maple, how about you? So I get asked that a lot and I think it's, don't be afraid to ask questions and be curious. Um, especially like you'll see a theme here today, like everyone talks about shifting and things changing and they're constantly mm -hmm. changing in the industry. So it's almost impossible to keep up. So having a good attitude and not being afraid to ask questions and ask for help or, you know, um, learn and keep learning. That's my piece of advice. Perfect. Thank you, Maple. Lori, how about you? Um, leverage the college. As a graduate, there are so many, our relationship uh, at George Brown with the industry is very strong. It is definitely one of the ways that it made it easier for me to, to get into the industry. So speak to whoever it is you have contact with, talk to, like, talk to whomever is out there because we have such a great relationship and we have so many conversations and folks who are looking out for grads and alumni that use the, use the college. Use it for for everything I can provide, and it will uh, it helps a hell of a lot more than you'd expect. That is excellent advice, um, Camille. Do you have a a final word to grads who are looking to enter the construction industry? Yeah, don't shy away from highlighting your experience. Uh, you know your previous work experience, even if it's not construction related. Um, Lori talked about transferable skills. Uh, be able to recognize what skills are transferable and definitely highlight those. Very nice. Okay, very good advice from all of you. Now, I think we have a few questions. Let me have a look. Sorry, I have a waiting for. I'm just, maybe I should go in the chat for that. Sorry, one sec. Oh, okay. So let me see what I have here. Uh, okay, here we go. Here we go. Here we go. Sorry. Going through a few. Um, oh, I have a question around the. Okay, what type of experiences are the health and safety team usually looking for from a recruiting standpoint? And I, I think it was maybe it was Camille who mentioned that there's an increase in demand. Mm. Yeah. So typically, someone who is going through or has already uh, received their NCSO, so that's the the designation. Um, but we also uh, quite often, those who are working on sites, even if you're working as like a, in, in the trades, 
quite often um, they actually transition from there. So there's a lot of courses that you can take, um, but just being on site and, and being and volunteering to be that that health and safety rep um, was a good start. Um, but definitely in terms of, uh, you know, kind of starting out, if you're if you're interested, start looking at some of the health and safety courses that are offered. Okay, uh, does anyone else have anything to share around that? Okay, I have another question. Where would graduates who are looking to pursue the construction industry go to apply for jobs pertaining to the industry? Now that's from Nat and maybe uh, curious about, are there any specific job uh, posting sites that someone would go to that's specific to the construction industry? Any anyone have any suggestions? I would there? say it's it's not spe uh, specific to the construction industry, but one of the things which tooth and nail took me to get it was on LinkedIn. And to be honest, the amount of positions that come up on LinkedIn, you just start reaching out to everyone who you have contact with. Again, there's that sort of uh, I'm going to call it a soft networking where you connect. Mm -hmm. The number of positions that I've seen come up is again it was it was surprising because I I had always thought it was a little bit of just a you know a bit of a pain, but. So many positions, um, folks at the college, again, you know, you connect with a lot of the folks in the construction uh, program, the CCET program at school. Um, there are positions all the time, especially now that things are getting back to normal. I've noticed a real bump in positions that folks are noting, um, HR folks uh, sort of at the different in the companies that you're looking at. I've, I've really found that there's a lot popping up that way. And just to add to that, Lori, because we, uh, for those who are on the participants, we do have GB Careers. It is our job posting site. And I always, always, always see amazing jobs in construction on our job posting site. So if you're not on that, that is my suggestion to you. Register and make sure you're viewing those jobs on a weekly basis. Changes all the time. Yeah. Um, okay, I have another question. Um, any advice for a student who wants to develop their entrepreneurial side? How broadly should I learn? Should I spend time learning on my own about real estate and development or double down on a subject like estimating, which I'm hearing, or sorry, which I'm learning in a systemic way, system, systemic way at school? Thanks for your time. Um, I don't know, Rob, you're, you're the entrepreneur on the panel. Do you want to address yeah. that question? Yeah, my my comfort level, um, my comfort level of now being a uh, a partner and business owner on the custom home side, it, it came from my uh, from the experience. I mm -hmm. again boots on the ground experience. It's not when I was younger and I was graduating. I also wanted to be an entrepreneur. I already wanted to be a custom home builder. Um, probably when I was sixteen, um, I just felt that it wasn't time. It's it's like the industry told me almost when it was time, right? Even starting my early years and having that early base experience of being on site, it was not, um, it was not uh, my time for me to enter into a custom home building um, uh, company or for my time for me to do it. It's like the industry told me. The industry told me, the trades I worked with told me, the, um, uh, the developers that obviously one of them I'm tied in with and is partners with, um, that's when it, it told me. It, it's not like I forced it. I felt like um, I feel that actually from past experiences, some people that I graduated with that did force the trying to open their own business early, um, it did not succeed. Um, so I would just go back to my past experiences and say, um, if you have that entrepreneurial feeling and that that bone in your body, I still say put your years of uh, put your years of experience behind you, get to know the industry. The contacts, which everyone here is talking about here, the contacts mm -hmm. are is what propelled me into the next level, into the next stage, into the next area of, of expertise to what we do. It was really the contacts, the relationships you built that either told you or pushed you into the next level. Mm, very interesting. Good advice. I think, you know, I know there's, an, there, you know, when you first start out and you have visions of I'm going to get this going for myself. But it takes years of experience to be really good at getting a business going. And well, there's also going to, again, we're going back to, you know, let's say residential, because I like to focus on the residential. That's where my passion is. On the residential side, you're coming out of school and you're 21, 22, 23, 24 years old. How many people are really going to trust you about building their home? 
mm-hmm. right? Sure. It's, Absolutely. it's later on Absolutely. and how, how our one, how the one division opened up was literally from other trades or other previous clients who have now gone full circle, 10 or 15 years, have reached another stage of their life. They come back to you and they're like, we've reached another stage of our life. We would like to build a custom home. And that's how actually mm-hmm. my custom home division started was from past experiences, past people that we had uh, built a condo for or had uh, mm-hmm. relationships with, they've come back around. Nice, good. I have a question. I'm gonna, it's, it's really a Lori question because they're asking about how do you become an estimator? Like what are the, I guess they're saying, you know, what are the, the, what do you need to have to be successful at it? They are touching also on education, which, I mean, I'm going to say you can go on to our, our site at George Brown College and find out. But, Lori, what's your perspective on how do you become really good at estimating? What, what are those skills? Again, for me, this is back to the transferable skills. One of the things for me that helped is that my background was in operations and finances. So I was very comfortable around money. Or I was very comfortable around how things run. So that, again, is a bit of a kind of a soft skill sort of on the between soft and hard skill um beyond that um one of the things i i am learning i can't say i've learned it i'm very much still learning is that estimating encompasses literally everything you can think of so what kind of education do you need everything which is of course impossible um but trying to get Again, we do have those courses. There are, and I know again, much, many of the, um, there's different uh, groups out there that offer the courses, getting the basics of estimating, understand what it is. Um, I think to Rob's point as well, like learning if, if you don't want to do the school route, if you want to get an education in the actual experience manner, going on site, learning how to read drawings, learning, like understanding how things go together. The education, it, it's much like any other parts. You're doing, you have to understand all of the same things as every other step. You just are looking at it from a different angle. Um, mm-hmm. Again, being good and the technology is a big part as well, which I think we've all spoken to is that it, it, you're not sitting there with, you know, big drawings and a pencil and it's, we use a program, everything. I do not use drawings anymore at work. Some of the other mm-hmm. folks still are more comfortable with it. Everything I do is digital. You have to be able to be dropped into a program, understand how to do that. So if you're comfortable with technology, that's always a plus. Um, but in terms of education, to be honest, just learning, like start with learning how to read drawings, like really, truly the basics, which is something that, yeah, you can go and you can work on site and get that. You can understand the processes because even though I'm not part of the actual building, I'm pricing what's being built and I have to understand what mm-hmm. folks like Maple and Rob are doing so that I can say, all right, this is how much it's going to cost and this is how much time it's going to take. Um, so I know that's not really a very particular answer, but really, I mean, again, if you can do an estimating course, it's great. It makes you understand a little bit more, but you're going to learn so much either again, boots on the ground or in a position, but understanding finances, being comfortable with numbers is a huge thing. If you don't think abstractly, if you can't think about numbers abstractly in construction drawings abstractly, it's going to be a challenge, but doesn't mean it's impossible. Uh Okay. Lori, thank you. Um, I have time for just like, two minutes. One question left. Um, if it could be wrapped up quickly, is it and, I, and it might be for Camille? I'm not sure, but is it okay to include informal, informal or personal construction experience on a resume, such as Reno projects at home? If so, what skills would you emphasize? I'll just quickly. I'll quickly say, um, sure. Why not? There's a lot of individuals who maybe help their father build their cottage. Right, so that's still experience, whether it was paid or not. Um, now, if it was something as minor as like you change the knobs on on the kitchen cabinet doors, maybe not. Um, mm-hmm. But it, it should be something of significance. And uh, so, what skills would you emphasize? Um, well, it's the technical skills, it's the problem solving skills, it's the project management skills. If you have to use, uh, you know, another trade. Um, so, whatever skills you thought you developed throughout that project then include it for sure. Okay. Thank you so much. The answers were rich with detail and and, and everything you shared today. Um, you know, it, it, it's, it's great to hear, first of all, the construction industry is rebounding. It's coming back. Uh, it sounds like you all have had the most extraordinary experiences and continue and will continue to have those experiences in, in the industry and the career you, you've chosen. Um, I appreciate your time so much. So, Lori, Rob, Camille, Maple, thank you so much for joining us today. Really appreciate it. Thanks. Thank for you. the 
Thank for you. The participants. Yeah. It was just great. Such great information. This is going to be up on our website once we um, finish off some captioning. It goes up on our website. So if anybody wants to go back and have a look at it, it's under alumni, it's under career services, and then it's under webinars. And I believe all of the panelists will receive uh, notification when it's up and you can and you can see it or you receive it in your email. Not sure. The Paloma's all got, got that in place. Um, for participants, we are doing a lot of this spotlight on different industries. Our next one is spotlight on finance, which we'll be delivering in the next couple of months. So look out on your email for information around that so you can register. Everyone, thanks so much for joining me. Take care.